like, let's say uh, you, you want to be a writer, you know, there are certain things that you want to write, but you can focus and you feel like you're not worthy. Uh, there's not much clarity. So there are so many things that uh, block you. So, mm -hmm. but if you have enough energy, you know, you can go ahead. So uh, whenever you, f uh, you think like, I don't think I can do it, switch, switch it to what if I can, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. then uh, if you ask you the right questions, something will start. So a guy like me who doesn't know anything about book writing, how can he or she become an international best-selling author? That's mm -hmm. what I asked myself 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. Good question always sets you off. And then the ripple effect mm -hmm. happened to my booklets. And the booklets are very popular. Uh, one of the uh, booklets um, my publisher editor wrote, uh, read, and then he thought, wow, you know, this guy should be an author. And then a year later, I became a published author. So once you, uh, whatever you think you cannot, what if I can? And that kind of thing is a, a new belief that will turn your life around. Peace and riches, blessings. I am Michael B. Beck with the host of Take Back Your Mind. Peace and blessings, everyone. As you know, I am Michael B. Beckwith, the founder of the Agape International Spiritual Center and your host on Take Back Your Mind. Obviously, when we say take back your mind, we're aware that all of us have a mind. But sometimes that mind is programmed by fear and doubt and worry and scarcity and lack and other ways of nefarious hypnotism. So we want to take back our mind so that it becomes an avenue of awareness of that which is real rather than programmed into lack and scarcity and limitation for us. So, so every week, I have someone that I get to have a conversation with that uh, speaks to their life, their teachings, in a way that will assist us all to become better versions of ourselves. So today, I have with me money and happiness expert, Ken Honda. His financial expertise comes from owning and managing several businesses, including an accounting company, a managerial consulting firm, and a venture capital corporation. His writings bridge the topics of finance and self-help, focusing on creating and generating personal wealth and happiness through deeper self-honesty. He's the author of the international best-selling book, Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. He recently released his new book, True Wealth, Nine Lessons from a Grandfather on Happiness and Abundance. And we're going to get into that a little bit later. Brother Ken, obviously, first of all, let me just, we can tell everybody that, you know, we had an opportunity a couple of years ago to meet in India in person. Yes. At, at the uh, ashram there in Rik Rik Rishikesh and spent some wonderful time together. You had your daughter with you. We became like instant buddies, instant brothers, instant friends. And subsequently, we've kept in touch. You have attended Agape. You came on Easter. And I was also on a, a program where your particular individuals here in Los Angeles that follow your teachings had me on the program for you and I to have a great a great dialogue. So it's been, it's been great uh, uh, knowing you and getting closer and closer with you and you're, you're an individual that I could actually call my friend. It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you so much. It means a lot to me. I so enjoyed meeting you. You know, when I bumped into India, you know, uh, you were dressing more Indian. So I thought you were uh, one of Indian people. And he said, <laughs> American, American. And then I think, uh, are you American? Is probably what I, what I said. And <laughs> then on, like, uh, uh, you were you know, Reverend Michael Beckwith. I'm like, oh, that's right. You know, but I didn't have your hair. So like, I, I totally thought it's a totally different person. I, and if I, if I sounded rude in any way, please excuse me. You know? No, no, no. You weren't rude at all. I mean, a lot of people who hadn't seen me in a while 
they'll know it's me without my long locks that I had for 16 years down to my back. I see. And, uh, uh, and as, as we were sharing offline here, when I went to Egypt a few years ago, I uh, had a kind of a, a spiritual awakening, kind of a rebirth, and it just informed me to cut off my hair, which I was going to cut it off in the king's chamber, but it was so dark, there was no electricity, and so I waited, and the first day I came back to the States from Kemet, otherwise known as Egypt, I went and got my hair cut off, and I just have kept it off ever since. So a lot of times people will uh, say, is that you, Michael? Is that, is that really you? <laughs> It's still me. <laughs> well, thanks, thanks to that, I got to know you personally before I just realized that you're a very famous uh, person. And so I just, uh, you know, now you're my mentor, but I just uh, feel this uh, brotherhood too in India. So I really respect that and really cherish that. And thank okay. you for inviting me to Easter as well. That was a dynamic experience for me. Yeah, that was beautiful. You you had your camera with you. You were taking shots and and, and videos, and it, it was good to have you there. It was really beautiful. Amazing. I thought it's a mass. You know, I I went to a, a Jesuit school in in Japan, so like usually very quiet, and you know you cannot make any sound. And then <laughs> with a, it's like a, a I don't know rock concert type of like wow energy. So if yeah, it, it's, it's it's a celebration. We're we're celebrating. We, we don't come to uh, beg or beseech God to give us anything. Mm -hmm. We come to celebrate what the presence is always doing. So celebration and gratitude allows one to be receptive to, wow. the, to the blessings that are always happening. We don't have to you know, beg God to give us a blessing. We just have to be receptive to the blessing, you know, which is a lot what you teach, you know, in, in, your, in, in your own way. And, Thank you. That you're very awesome. you're, you're very hip on gratitude and Thanksgiving and and um, but let me ask you this. You know, tell us a little bit about your journey with abundance. You know, and and what why you became so passionate to help others and and, and to walk the path of abundance and to have a a great relationship with money. What, how did your journey start? Thank you for asking. So I was born into a very unique family. My father was a tax accountant. My, my mother was a housewife, but my father's education was so unique, he started teaching me about money since I was five or six. Mm. And uh, um, I became his assistant when I was um, at nine. He, I was supposed to bring Japanese tea to his clients when they visited us on weekends. So I could harass uh, um, a, you know adult person with, what's your ROE, sir? You know, like with the old, <laughs> I don't know uh, what it means, but... I know I can surprise them. So uh -huh. I started learning about finances when I was 10. And I started my business when I was 21. And uh, I retired at the age 29 for my baby girl whom you met. Now he's yes. a singer. Uh, and then I retired for four years. During the semi-retirement, I was so fortunate and lucky to be able to have some time off of my life in my um a uh, very young uh, uh, stage of my life, but not many people can afford to do that. It's because they don't have uh, financial education. They don't know anything about money. So I thought, okay, I should uh, do something and then started helping people. And um, I, ever since I've been very passionate about uh, helping people. Yeah, you started writing little notes of stuff to people Yes. That, that became almost like your first book, right? You were just writing like little notes or a little, little bit of guidance to people. Yes. yes. It was only like a two pages. Mm -hmm. They might love them. They wanted me to uh, write more. So I wrote uh, four pages, eight pages, and um, just about 26 pages. Um, I stapled them and just started giving every, everywhere. And then I got sore hands. So my friend asked me to hire a printer, which I did. And uh, because of the mix-up of the order, I wanted to only have uh, 500, but uh, I, ended, I ended up ordering 3,000 because it's cheaper. Right. <laughs> boxes and boxes came into my place, and then I went crazy giving away. And that was what kind of like a movement I started. And I gave away another 3,000, another 5,000. And by the time I gave away 100,000 copies, uh, published. And you say you, you gave away, you didn't sell them, you gave them away? No, because it was my joy. You uh -huh. know, so I just wanted to um, give all the my booklets away. It costs about a dollar, but, you know, it's yeah. okay. 
So, um, and what, what what was the title of that book? A steps to financial uh, abundance and happiness. So oh, it's a beautiful. lesson. Uh, that's my first book and sold about a hundred thousand copies, and then the rest is history. So I've been publishing for twenty two years. Wow, that was a, that's a beautiful start. You started out by giving. Yes. You started out by being generous. You started out by just wanting to assist, and then that wave then produced all these other opportunities for you to publish. And uh, like you say, for 22 years, you've been bringing the good news to so many people. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so at this, po this point in your development, how would you, de what would be your description of wealth? So, you know, I wrote uh, what I think of wealth in, in my book, True Wealth. There are invisible assets and visible assets. People understand visible assets like cars, real estate, and all that. But what's more important is invisible assets. Mm -hmm. Invisible assets are those trust, friendship, generosity, mm -hmm. kindness, experiences, mm -hmm. wisdom. Those things are invisible asset. And and then we know it's important, even though we tend to overlook uh, those things. And then we take sometimes we take it for granted. And among the invisible assets, there are two kinds. One, you can turn it into cash, like experiences, wisdom, and knowledge. But there is a, a invisible asset that you cannot really turn into anything, which is still very precious, like love, friendship, and uh, generosity and kindness. I mean, mm -hmm. you cannot cash that out. But being kind is one of the most important asset, invisible asset that any person can have. Unfortunately, people don't pay much respect for that now. But I think that though uh, that kind of value uh, will be valued in years to come, we we pay more respect to the people who are kind and generous. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's absolutely true. I recently was speaking at Agape, and I was asking people to actually put that on their to-do list. Mm -hmm. Like at two o'clock, I'm going to be kind to whoever I'm with. Mm. And so that because we have all these other things on our to-do list, we're going to go to this appointment, we're going to go to this business meeting. We're going to do all these things that we have to do, but like you say, sometimes we get lost in all of the doing, and we forget what really matters. And what really matters oftentimes is deliberate kindness, compassion, huh? generosity, love. And so I just I challenged the congregation a few weeks ago to put it on the to-do list, and whoever they're with, put a, put, put a time, like I'm deliberate kindness at 2 o'clock. And whoever nice. you're with at that time, uh -huh. whether, you, whether you're in a meeting, whether you like the person, whether you don't like the person, it doesn't matter. Uh -huh. Just do an act of kindness. Beautiful. And, and kindness is not just being nice. Kindness is actually doing something for somebody uh -huh. You know that, that helps them in order for us to build up those muscles. So the fact that you're calling this the invisible assets, kindness, compassion, love, it... Uh, you're expanding the definition of wealth. So wealth isn't just uh, your retirement account and how much money you have in the bank. It's uh, it's actually something else. Yeah, yeah. This is this is beautiful. Now, I imagine that if one is growing in this area, it helps them break free from the myth of scarcity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, break that down us for me because there is a big myth of scarcity. Is it? People live in this very small point of view about scarcity and lack and limitation. What do you have to say about that in your your teaching? Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's almost like a, a there's a pie in front of you. Mm. So what I take, you know, the other people cannot have the pie. But when it uh, when it comes to economy, uh, so like there there say there are four people. Mm -hmm. if there's no money circulating. Everybody is poor. Mm -hmm. But each <laughs> If this person starts uh, handing out ten thousand dollars to the next person, and the next person, next person, so ten thousand dollars are circulating, and if there are hundred thousand dollars circulating, that enriches everybody. So if there's little money circulating, economy is not good. Mm -hmm. But if there's a lot of money circulating, everybody is abundant. Mm -hmm. So by receiving, by you receiving, you can pass it to the other person. So that is really the key. It's not how much you have. It's how much you receive and how much you circulate. Once you're good at doing that, 
you are more successful and abundant. So once you think, if I take, somebody will t、uh, lose. If I win, somebody will lose. It's a zero sum game. But our world is not、uh, made up that way. Like if, you're, <clears throat> if Michael's book is selling a lot,、uh, that doesn't mean that、um, my book sales will go down. Right. If your books,、uh, if the people who love your books think that's a great book, Okay, maybe Ken's book will be next. So, like, you know,、uh, everybody becomes successful. That's why all the entrepreneurs hang around together because one person's success、uh, contributes to、uh, your friend's success and everybody sort of wins together. It's what I call it's a ninja way. You know, when ninja go climb over the wall, just <laughs> I push you up, Michael, and then once you're on the top, you pull me up.、That's、right, right. Oh, right. You're、so. talking about challenging a, a scarcity mindset、mm -hmm. that basically creates jealousy or、uh, immature competition,、yeah. lack, things of that particular nature. And you're, you're inviting people to actually participate in the law of circulation because all of nature is always circulating. And、yes. Every tree is supporting every other tree. There's a circulation of the tree breathing in our carbon. Uh, dioxide, we're, we're, we're breathing in the oxygen. It's, everything is circulating. When it becomes stagnant,、mm -hmm. that's when there's an issue. Yes. And, and we see that a lot. I mean, I can remember reading an article,、uh, it was many years ago, where they were talking about a small village, a small town, city in Germany that、um, printed their own currency. The currency was legal tender. Uh -huh. Only thing about the currency was that it expired after so many years. Yes. So it circulated all the time because you couldn't just keep it in the bank. Yes, because it, it, every month it'll be 10% less. So you have、yeah. to spend fast. Otherwise, it, it's going、right. to go out of you. But, but what they found out was that after, in, after like four or five years, there was no homelessness and there was no unemployment because the money was circulating, but then the government. Made them stop、mm -hmm. and they couldn't、uh, print the legal tender anymore. And, and then within five years, the particular city matched the same level of unemployment and the same level of, of homelessness that it was before because they, the, the circulation stopped and people began to hoard. And that's what happens, I guess, in a scarcity mindset.、Mm -hmm. the, people go from circulation to hoarding.、Mm -hmm. you, you have a whole thing about happy money. Yes, and it, versus unhappy money. Yeah, we're, we're experimenting that in one of the、uh, small towns in Hokkaido.、Mm -hmm. My friend is circulating a digital currency that's like that. So, you know,、uh, we'll let you know that how our experiment is doing. But、and、anyway, it's, it's a digital currency that he created? Yes, yeah.、Okay. And it's a local a community currency that everybody benefits. So, by the way,、um, happy money is money that brings you joy when you receive it and gives you.、Uh, Happy feeling when you spend it.、Uh, unfortunately, 95% of our money circulating is unhappy money. So when we receive, we feel upset because it's not enough. When we spend it, we feel upset, frustrated because、uh, everything is going high up in value. So it gives you a bad feeling and you, you get upset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.、So、that's what I call unhappy money.、Mm -hmm. So You say most money is unhappy、mm -hmm. because people, they receive money and instead of being grateful, they say this isn't enough. And then when they give money,、uh, they're looking at the price of something, inflation. So the money exchange that people are having is bringing them unhappiness. And so to break free from that, you're suggesting what?、Uh, when you receive money, regardless of the amount, you're very grateful. And、yes. then when you give money, you're suggesting that there's also a level of gratitude there because you get to circulate, you get to support. Is that what you're saying? Yes.、Yeah, so you can appreciate uh, both uh, money coming in and going out. My mentor, Wahe Takeda, who used to be called Warren Buffett of Japan, he、mm -hmm. said, Arigato in, arigato out. That、mm -hmm. means when money comes in, thank you for,、mm -hmm. for coming in. Thank you, clients. Like,、uh, I think you are receiving. Uh, money from all the supporters of Aga Agape, right? They could have chosen some other churches, but they、mm -hmm. chose you.、Mm -hmm. Wow, like, thank you for trusting me. Thank you for voting 
you know, vote of confidence. So thank you for that. So mm -hmm. we feel grateful for the uh, trust and generosity and kindness that this person shows. You, uh, you're chosen out of 20,000 other coaches in LA. And then, wow, thank you for the trust. And when you pay bills, also at the same time, you can appreciate you, uh, the electricity installed in you. That's why uh, just you, you get internet, you can heat your house, you can cool down your uh, apartment. And, and then on, on and on, there are so many th little things that you can appreciate. So once you start appreciating what you have, you feel like uh, I can pay bills because I received this money from my clients. So thank you for giving me money. Thank you for doing this. So once you start uh, doing uh, appreciating everybody, you, you can start this energy flowing out and flowing in and people can notice you. You know, people think you're a nice person and then think about two florists you know, who is just very depressed and he, he doesn't want to touch the flowers. The other one is full of joy. Just like, hi, Michael, these are the beautiful roses. I think your you know, friends will love it. So uh, you want to choose them. So if you're joyful, full of appreciation, uh, you have more clients, you have more friends, and you'll be blessed and supported by so many people. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that because sometimes, when, like yourself, when people will tell me about their bills or something like that, I'll often say, "Well, listen, you you received the electricity first. You already had. You've already used it. Yeah. So you would have you would be grateful that that you were trusted to receive what it, and the bill you're paying is for something you already have. So that you want to be grateful that you were trusted by whatever the corporation was to give you something first. Mm -hmm. Now you're just paying that energy out. So it becomes." Um, uh, the, the key point is our attitudes, a mindset mm -hmm. of gratitude and circulation. Because I know, I know, those for me, when money comes in, I don't. Obviously, you want a big, bigger amounts. But even if it's something that my mind would say small, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Yes, I'm, I mean, on a personal level, mm -hmm. and then also, even as a spiritual community, we don't. If someone has very little to give. We are just great. We are just as grateful for whatever that person can give to support Agape Ministries mm -hmm. as someone that's giving a lot of money, mm -hmm. because we know that that individual that's big for them. Mm -hmm. you know, that that's that made me more to them than somebody who has a lot of money. Mm -hmm. You know, so we stay we stay in gratitude for we don't even care about the amount. We just stay in gratitude. That's beautiful, as you were saying earlier. Yeah. Now, tell us a little bit about the six abundance blocking money beliefs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love these subjects. You know, we feel guilty when we receive money. You know, we are so good at giving. We're gi giving, we're giving our friends. We're just uh, giving support. We are kind to other people. But we are so bad at asking. So uh, um, when we ask, we feel guilty. So when money is offered, you feel, oh, well, it's okay, it's okay. Because we feel like we are taking something away from the person. Mm -hmm. But once you are free of guilt and you're willing to receive, you're free to receive, and then you can circulate the money. So guilt is definitely a money blocker. Okay. I think jealousy is also something. When, when you see somebody is making money or like I got promoted, uh, if you see that kind of thing on Facebook with your, with their friends, you feel jealousy. Mm -hmm. So instead of feeling jealousy, uh, the affirmation I'd suggest is, "I am next." <laughs> when somebody's getting married, I'm next. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to get married, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And if you what, uh, if you get, a, you know, if you got uh, some kind of lottery money, I'm next. So mm -hmm. when when a jealousy comes into your um, your system. Next time you can say, I'm next, and then feel like, oh, okay. So uh, jealousy is a big killer for money. And also competition. I'm better than her, him or her. That kind of energy also repel, um, repels uh, money away too. So there are many things that uh, we can heal. You know, because of the pain and traumatic experiences in your childhood, we were denied for our dream mountain bike. And then we feel like already depressed. I want to go after my dreams. I don't think it's going to happen because uh, 
you know, my 12th birthday uh, year, um, year old birthday gift was not given to me because my parents had a hard time. So I don't think I can be on, on my own to start my business because I'm uh, uh, I'm worthy. So mm -hmm. unless you heal this kind of uh, money blocks, you know, you cannot really dream right and then go after what you want. Jealousy, immature competition, and what was the first one? Uh, a guilt. Guilt, yeah, being guilty if somebody's giving you money or blessings are coming in, you feel guilty about it, like you may not deserve it. Right. So, uh huh. And then you said competition, uh, yeah. jealousy, uh, and and you you also talked about unworthiness that, that unworthiness could have crept in based on some kind of uh, childhood trauma mm -hmm. or some type of misinterpretation of a childhood experience. Mm -hmm. You may not feel worthy about the blessings of money or prosperity coming into your life. Would, any uh, any other blocks that you would? Yeah, I think uh, the other one I would say is not yet. You know, not I want to go in the world. Not yet. You know, maybe after I retire. You know, uh, a great job is offered, but not yet. I'm not there yet. You know, so like uh, we always postpone things. You know, mm -hmm. we postpone what we want to do. Uh, when I uh, whenever I say that, there are a few things already popping into your head. Okay. I haven't done that. I haven't d done this. I haven't done that. So I hope uh, you start doing it while you're alive, mm -hmm. because you know uh, you don't know how many years uh, are left for you. Sometimes mm -hmm. people die in forties and fifties and heart attack and accidents. So I think you better hurry if you if there's something you want to do. So mm -hmm. like not yet, or um, because it's going to cost you. You know, is also a money a repellent that. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I sometimes call that living life on the layaway plan. You're gonna, ah. you're gonna, you're gonna save it for later. You know? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this later. Living life on the layaway plan. When you're, you're talking about living full out now, yes, and letting the results kind of form themselves around your living now. I appreciate that. I was, somebody was asking me to participate in a book recently, which I had to do some writing today, and they wanted to know what. Um, legacy meant to me, living legacy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I talked about the fact that, um, yeah, legacy, legacy is what you leave behind, but a living legacy is an awareness that your, your thought, your words, and your actions affect everyone, even people you don't even know in the, right now. It creates, it creates a ripple. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually, when, you, when you're living inside of the question, how can I make a positive impact on the world? And you live in that question right now, you're becoming a living legacy in this moment. You're not waiting in the in the future to leave a legacy. Mm -hmm. You're actually living the legacy vibrationally now and you're affecting the world now, you see. Yeah. And this is what I'm 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 hearing you talk about, you see, as we remove these uh, particular uh money blocking blocks. Mm -hmm. So what would you um I know that you you teach certain five beliefs that you you want people to really capture in order to break free from this scarcity mindset. What would some of those beliefs be that we have to actually embody? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when we think, like, let's say uh, you, you want to be a writer, you know, there are certain things that you want to write, but you can uh, focus and you feel like you're not worthy. Uh, there's not much clarity. So there are so many things that uh, block you. So, mm -hmm. but if you have enough energy you know, you can go ahead. So uh, whenever you f uh, you think like, I don't think I can do it, switch switch it to, what if I can? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. then uh, if you ask you the right questions, something will start. So a guy like me who doesn't know anything about book writing, how can he or she become an international best-selling author? That's mm -hmm. what I asked myself 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. Good question always sets you off. And then, Okay, I know how to begin. I don't know how at all. But what if I start writing a few pages, which I did. So I started out just writing a few pages without knowing what takes uh, me, uh, where this is taking me. And then show them to my friends who were regular friends. And then the ripple effect mm -hmm. to my booklets. And the booklets are very popular. Uh, one of the uh, booklets... Um, my publisher editor wrote uh, read, and then he thought, "Wow, you know, this guy should be an author." 
and then a year later, I became a published author. So once you, uh, whatever you think you cannot, what if I can? And that kind of thing is a, a new belief that will turn your life around. And uh, it there are so many steps, and you, you don't, you cannot take, you know, one giant step to the top of the Mount Everest. You have to make probably like uh, two million steps to get there. But I like this because, like you, I teach that the universe through law will answer whatever question you ask. Mm -hmm. So if you ask, what if, you know, the universe will show you what if, mm. it'll, it'll begin to create this, this serendipity and the coincidences and the synchronicities and all of that to show you what if. But if you say, I can't, or I'm going to wait, as you were saying earlier, I'm going to wait till later, mm -hmm. or I don't know how to do it, so I'm not even going to try. But if you just instead say, what if? You know, what if? What would happen to me if all of my needs were met? You know, what, would, what if? What if everything was working for me? Then the universe will show you the answer to that question. You're elevating people to live in a different dynamic, mm -hmm. which is ex extremely important. Yeah. So uh, any any other beliefs come to mind? And yes, and uh, and uh, the other thing I would say is like I don't think I'll be supported by anyone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another big one. That mm -hmm. even if I just open up my restaurant mm -hmm. or my dream, or even if I just uh, start teaching, coaching, whatever that thing you want to do, nobody will show up. That's mm -hmm. how I used to feel twenty three years ago because I was just a retired happy daddy, you know, who is <laughs> good at changing diapers in two seconds, but I had no other skills. <laughs> Uh, who'd want to listen to me? <laughs> yeah, and then I, I asked me, I asked myself the same question: What if millions of people are going to support me? And I said, "There's no way," you know. Mm -hmm. Your mind so said, "No way." Yeah, I went back and forth and back and forth, mm -hmm. and like 20 years later, I sold almost 9 million copies of my books, and my uh, podcast is a uh, you know 52 million downloads. Mm -hmm. We have 130 million people in Japan, so it's almost like. Um, half the population of Japan have listened to my podcast, you know. So right. people, a lot of people can recognize my voice, not my face. But right. it's amazing. And then I started from nothing, zero. So um, the way I, I changed my belief is that what if one person supports me? What if two people, mm -hmm. three people? Mm -hmm. So it, in order to do that, you have to put out a smoke signal, like a Native American person, mm -hmm. and then your tribe will see it. I think that's what, you, uh, Michael, uh, that's what you're exactly doing it. You are just shooting a smoke signal of agape, right? Mm -hmm. And then people are looking at it. Wow, that's so beautiful. And then they gather together. I witnessed at the uh, Easter uh, ceremony. That was a mind-blowing experience. If you haven't been there, definitely please go because it's really going to transform your life. I feel the energy like cleansing aura and uh, I feel very transformed. So mm -hmm. it was like 100 times incredibly better than I thought. I thought it's uh, <laughs> like you preach and then I try not to fall asleep. That kind of like imagine. <laughs> you, you were expecting that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if there is anybody who can sleep in that, oh, wow, that's amazing. You know, it's everybody standing and like so much energy. So uh, I think oh, you you need to s shoot up your smoke signal. Right. Your tribe will find you, you right. know, and, and then you feel like there's nobody as of now. But think about it when you when you started Agape, how many how many supporters were there? The first service we had uh, like 400 people show up just because they were curious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supporters, yeah. looking friends. But then when we actually got going, there, yeah. was than, there was less than 50 people. I know. That's the first tribe, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And then that grew. And it, it became 60. It became 80. It kept growing until we had to keep switching locations to have a space big enough. Yeah. yeah. So now, you know, we have, we're in 180 countries because we're on, wow. it's online. Yeah. yeah. So no, most, of the, okay. most of the people are global. And then we have a robust a local group, people who either plan their vacations or business, as you did. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I was the one. Meetings, yeah, to, to be at Agape on a Sunday, or they live 
LA or LA adjacent. So there's a, there's a robust local group of people, but there's thousands of people that are obviously all around the globe. But it started, it started with 40 or 50 people. Wow. And um, as you said, we put up a smoke signal and and uh, our, the tribe found us. Now the tribe is uh, expanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we, we've been here long enough to see the things that I was teaching 40 years ago mm. were woo-woo. Mm -hmm. Now it's, it's scientifically validated. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Why are those people sitting with their eyes closed? <laughs> what is this visioning thing? You know, uh -huh. <laughs> what what are they doing? With their reenchanting their imagination, you know. Uh, and now all of that is pretty much within the, you know, it's it's in the field of conversation, you know. And so n now what we teach can be validated scientifically in terms of brainwave activity, brainwave coherence, all of that, you know. So. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Any any other beliefs? Because I want to that did you want you feel that people should exchange it. You broke down the blocks. Mm -hmm. Is there any other beliefs that need to be re, that need to replace those blocks? Yes, yeah. So the last one I would say, you know, because there are so many I like to share, but the last one I want to say is curiosity. Mm. You know, I just want you to be curious about your life. You know, mm -hmm. what if I start this? What if I start this now? How would it turn out to be? Mm -hmm. So, uh, what if I start another career? What if I just start, uh, just travel around the world? What if I start singing? So, <laughs> uh, yeah, ask yourself. I mean, you don't have to be a, become a uh, like Celine Dion or you know uh, Taylor Swift. <laughs> you know, you can just sing for yourself. It's just an expression of love. So, what if you start something? And then get curious about it. That will really start to change your belief system around around money, life, and everything. And then the rest is yours. You know, I'm not here to teach you anything. I'm just um, I'm here to inspire you to be somebody different who is supposed to be, you know, you. I, I like this because you're, you're talking about identity. When you said uh, you're here to be someone different, that is so true. Because when we shift our identity from the small personality of I can never make it, I came from a family who never made it, you know, and you actually shift your identity by asking these questions, what if this, becoming curious about your life, you actually grow into a different version of yourself. Your identity changes. Mm -hmm. And then the universal law matches your new identity. Mm. It, it recognizes your, the frequency of your new identity and now opportunities show up that couldn't show up when you were in your small identity, your small personality. But when I'm hearing you speak, your questions are opening you up to be a different person. Yes. That's very important. You're talking about transformation. Yes, oh, without uh, confronting yourself too much, without just making a giant step. Yeah. You know, curiosity is an interesting door once you want to like try to take a peek, you know, like what's what's over there, and then boom, the door opens. So mm -hmm. I want you to get curious about your what's behind the doors. What if I open the new door, you know, mm -hmm. and then, uh, it'll change you automatically. So when you whatever you hear twice, and then pay attention. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> whatever happens three times, and then uh, just jump on it, you know. Like I I heard Egypt twice today. So that's something, you know, I, I need to pay attention to. You need to pay attention because I'm taking a group next year to Egypt. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I can be part of it. You yeah, know, you so gotta, you got to come with yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, something like that is a sign. So um, that's what I wrote in my books. But uh, whatever you feel like, you know, there's a sign, just uh, pay pay attention to it and get, get curious about it. And then that's how I think. Uh, we can be uh, having such a great life. <laughs> Let's talk about um, true wealth. The nine lessons from a grandfather on happiness and abundance. Mm -hmm. Now, what inspired you to write this book after Happy Money? And why did you choose to make it a novel? Yeah, so actually, I'm a novelist. You know, I I have written about uh, sixty or seventy original books and um, uh, sixty many... or seventy. Yeah, I don't. I lost count. You know. <laughs> And uh, um, so I, I keep just publishing uh, one book every two months. 
Mm-hmm. So um, I, I write a lot and fast. You know, I have a computer in my car, mm-hmm. I, in my like full studies. I write all the time. I'm, I'm addicted to writing, you know. Mm-hmm. So I love it. I love stories. I love reading stories. I love te- telling stories, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I wish my grandparents just taught me this. But uh, unfortunately, uh, in the modern world, we don't get to spend more time with our uh, grandparents, you know, mm-hmm. because uh, we tend to be separated. We live separately from our grandparents, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are in a different cities or they're in already nursing homes. So we don't get to see meet your grandparents in depth. So we the the cut, ties are cut off. So I was uh, um, thinking if there is a story teaching from grandparents to um, to their uh, to their grandkids, you know what would they want to say? So because they have learned life lessons uh, in positive way and negative way. Mm-hmm. And those are the things I wish you do. I wish you don't. So uh, if grandparents, wealthy, wise grandparents who are not perfect, what if he tells a story about his life? Mm-hmm. What if his grandfather tries to find out what happened? So, um, you know, by meeting his his best friends, um, th- that is the inspiration for me to write this story. Mm-hmm. Now, in this journey where the grandfather, I guess, is meeting, Kai's grandfather is meeting mm-hmm. uh, these different people. Mm-hmm. Were any of these characters based on actual people you know? Yes, yes. So there are uh, three friends that he, he used to hang around when he was younger, in mm-hmm. his 20s. You know, there's a, a person from Bhutan, the, the guy from uh, Bangkok, you know, a mm-hmm. businessman, mm-hmm. a spiritual leader, and the other one is also another uh, spiritual leader in, from Kyoto, which mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to take you in a soon. Okay. Uh, I, alre- I already did the scouting for the location. So, really? Yeah, I'm going to invite Michael and uh, his family to uh, Kyoto and Tokyo. I'm thinking of doing two events. But anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> Get ready, everybody, because I'm going to Japan 2025. <laughs> yeah. Uh, He's bringing whoever, me over there to speak and to teach. <laughs> yeah, whoever is welcome, you know, uh, because I... Uh, there are so many Michaels fans. I didn't know uh, that uh, there are so many. You know, I knew there are, but uh, everybody's so excited. So I have to like wait, wait, wait. You know, sometime next year. So, but we'll arrange the schedule. So uh, going back to the story. So um, because we don't get to meet grandparents' friends, right? So uh, food, uh, by so he never had a good connection with his grandfather. Uh, but by meeting his uh, best uh, friends, he he understands. He tries to understand what kind of life he had, and then what kind of uh, life he could have, which he mm-hmm. didn't. Mm-hmm. And then the you know passed down to his father, and then him. So by understanding what's going on with your father, with your grandfather, you see the whole picture, and you see the good part, uh, I well, see. the negative part. So that's what we get. So we don't only get the good part either. So that's life lessons. I, I understand. So is the, the, the character's name is Kai? Kai, yes. Kai, uh-huh. Huh? And so basically he's gleaning lessons from his grandfather. Yes. And he's getting it a holistic way. He's learning from his grandfather's friends even. Yes. The kind of life that his grandfather had. So there's all kinds of lessons in there. Yes. I'm inspired by Celestine <laughs> Prophecy. So, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, this grandfather left nine letters. Each mm-hmm. letter has a title. The first mm-hmm. letter is a synchronicity. Mm-hmm. His grandfather writes about synchronicity, and then something happens. And mm-hmm. then um, a 20-year-old K gets inspired and take mm-hmm. action. And then he just, ah, okay, I should meet this person out of nowhere. And then uh, he finds uh, his grandfather's best friend. And uh, by meeting one by one, he gets the life lessons that he never got from um, grandfather himself. Oh, that's that's a very uh, interesting way to bring out the le- the lesson. That's a that's a beautiful that's beautiful. So so one of the lessons is is synchronicity and yes. coincidence. Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. yes, and intuition and action and work and that kind of thing. 
So, and failure is uh, my favorite. So, because we are so afraid of failures and, and, and the fear of failures stop us so much. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, but in, in, in order to have a fun life, you have to get used to failures uh, because that means that you tried a lot. So uh, I'm teaching my daughter too, you know, the more failures you experience, the more success will follow. So the well, fear of... It is true. You look at you look at athletics, you see the people who've had the mo most home runs ha also had the most strikeouts. <laughs> yes, that's, that's me. <laughs> or, or people who had made the most baskets in the NBA also missed the most baskets because they were, they were shooting more. Right. So, but, but, and, and, and saying is easy, but like uh, just experiencing failures or, is a horrible experience, right? So you have to get used to this. Oh, oh my God, I shouldn't have done it. I should have thought sooner or wiser, but that really gives you energy and you can be more accommodating for other people's failure. So when some, uh, some people like your staff make mistakes, you can be more forgiving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're basically telling people that the failure is like a lesson they're learning. It's, yes. It's not, it's not, you're just, you're requalifying the word failure uh, to this is lesson. And if you learn the lesson, it becomes a blessing. Yes. So, but you're not going to get the blessing unless you actually go for something. But if, you, if you're afraid of failing and you don't go for anything, you don't get to grow. You have no lessons. You have no blessings. You just didn't fail because you didn't try anything. You didn't, you didn't go for it. Yeah. Thank yeah, there are, there are people who, um, what we, we used to say years ago, paralysis by analysis. <laughs> people uh -huh. just, they, they analyze so much, they won't move. They won't do anything because they, <laughs> everything has to be perfect before they try anything. So they paralyze themselves by overanalyzing and then they don't fail, but they didn't even do, try anything. <laughs> <laughs> but that's most of us, you know? Yeah, right. So you're, you're the other thing, um, I like this. I, I, I'm looking at Kay is saying, uh, a friend of his grandfather says, warns Kay, mm. when a person has more money than their inner money container can hold, it becomes a heavy burden on their life. What is this any money, money container, and how can we lighten the load with our money? That's a, I think that's a very powerful statement you wrote in the book. Yeah, yeah. So I think everyone is born with a certain money container. Some born with small, like if you're a school uh, kindergarten teacher, your yeah. money container is small. Mm -hmm. And if you're Elon Musk or Warren Buffett, the money container is huge. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how big your money container is. Because yeah. if it's small, but if you try to put all the money in, they're always going to make a crack. Mm -hmm. So if you want to grow your money container, you can start giving more. Giving more to people, as a result, it comes back. And then the money container grows. So the more you give, the money container will, will be bigger. And then unless you give, it will not uh, become big. If you try to get quick, easy money, and then it's going to um, it's a fast money, it's going to break uh, the container. Mm -hmm. So you're going back to the law of circulation again. Yes. So, so as, as, as money comes in, in order to expand your capacity, you have to find a way to generate or to be generous mm -hmm. so that you continue to expand your container through generosity. And this is why I, we teach metaphysically to make sure that you give on a regular basis, regardless of the amount. You start off, you can start off, you know, with a small amount, depending on what your container is in that particular moment. Mm -hmm. But if you do it regularly, uh, uh, what happens on the subconscious mind is your subconscious starts to believe you have more than enough mm. because you're giving. Mm -hmm. And then since most of our life is run by our subconscious beliefs and tendencies and laws, then we start creating from the subconscious the world that we have more than enough. Yes. And, and like you said, that, that grandfather was teaching through his friends, coincidences and serendipities and things show up mm -hmm. that we couldn't even see before because we were blinded by the blocks, competition, jealousy, scarcity mindsets and the like. So you, you have a very powerful yet simple way of bringing people out of the scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that it's so necessary because the whole world is trying to hypnotize us 
into the belief that there's not enough good to go around. Yes. You know, the whole, all the, 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 the uh, immature, immature economic systems that run, that governments perpetuate, uh, it's always lack, 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 not enough, not enough, not enough. Mm -hmm. And people live in that state. So you're helping to break people out of that. Yeah, but in an interesting, fun way, you know, by not focusing too much about our scarcity mindset, you know, uh, I hope money becomes there for you uh, at some point of your life because uh, money can become a, a icy, frozen, uh, a cold, uh, mm -hmm. frozen ice, but money can be water, you know, just money flows like river. But mm -hmm. if there's too much, it becomes flood. When it's too little, it becomes drought. So the ideal situation is money becomes air. You can breathe in as much as you want and breathe out as much as you want. But you can hold it and you're going to die. So just <laughs> you're, you're in the flow of breathing more and breathing Stag out. <laughs> Stagnation is not the key. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, would you <laughs> would you say that, uh, like, for instance, we sometimes read about or we hear uh, about these a lot of these billionaires who, you know, they have a lot of money, but a lot of times they're surrounded by scandal and they're surrounded by all kinds of dubious things that they're involved in. Would you say that their money container is, even though they may have a lot of money, mm -hmm. the container is so small that it's, it's creating crisis in their life, you know, and, and things of that particular need, they end up not making right choices and uh -huh. doing nefarious things and yeah. not, not helping, but actually, um, doing negative things in the world. I mean, is that because the vibrational money container is small? It's not the it's not the, about the size. It's the energy of mm -hmm. money that's in the container. You know, right. they usually have uh, uh, busy money and violent money. Ah. So like, you know, the gangster people, uh, they, they are involved with the, uh, it's not happy money. It's violent, busy, uh, uh, fighting money. That's why they get into trouble, you know. Mm -hmm. That one of my mentors, uh, Wahe Takeda, he created a, a big business around babies' cookies. You know, baby cookies. Yeah, you make only one cent for one one cookie. Uh -huh. So his whole pocket is still thirty cents. Can you believe that? <laughs> it's so cheap, you know. So uh, he makes so little money with every little thing, but mm -hmm. he sells millions of uh, pockets. That's why he became a in a multi-millionaire. But uh, if you just try to make violent money, the violent money comes into your house. That's why uh, a lot of fights, a lot of uh, lawsuits happen because of this energy. You know, in my 21 uh, years of my career, the biggest complaint I had in my career is the temperature room of my seminar is too hot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's like, what we get, you know, it's very uh, peaceful. Why? Because you have a lot of people there? <laughs> I think. <laughs> so like, you know, I, I don't get many complaints and uh, I'm living in such a peaceful environment that I don't have to worry about locking my doors, you know. So mm -hmm. so if you're just surrounded by happy people, you don't have to worry about the conflicts or anything that um, you're supported, you're, guard, you're guarded by happy energy. Right. So if you try to get uh, unhappy, violent energy, you have to have like four bodyguards, you know. To ah, I see, I see. Yes, 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 yes. Because you're, you're, um, you may have a lot of money, but you have a protective scarcity mindset. Yeah. And, 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 and in some cases, violent mindset. Mm -hmm. So you have to feel it. You have to be protected all the time. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. Why he didn't even have a, a guard, you know, mm -hmm. in a, in his house, uh, and then it's a huge, big place, but the door is open. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to his place, uh, there was not even a lock. Who was this? He, uh, my my friend, uh, my mentor, to Wahe Takeda. Oh yeah, right. He didn't have a bodyguard. He didn't have anybody. Uh, the door is automatic, <laughs> and when you go there, it opens. <laughs> and mm -hmm. then I asked him, "Don't you need to have a security of some some kind?" And he said, if you put up a wall, you attract attack. Yeah. So no defense, no attack. And he right. was smart. Yeah, he knew the metaphysical principle of that. Yeah. So he says, I'm not worried. I'm not afraid. That's why I don't attract attack. 
and then he's truly a master and he he didn't really care I, we know that there is lots of gold in there but you know mm -hmm. like all of us know but somehow he was protected miraculously mm -hmm. yeah I, I understand that I, mean, I, I, I sometimes I'm at places and people will come up and they recognize me and they'll say well where, where, where's your uh, where's your security? <laughs> well, I don't have any. I'm just out here. <laughs> you know? if you don't I'm have sure anybody, angels. Angels are protecting you. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. You said that. I remember um, uh, the great teacher Joe Goldsmith um, was was working with uh, someone and uh, was praying for someone. And this this person had the habit of taking. He was a businessman, mm -hmm. and he had the habit of taking. The, the the money at the end of the day, back in the old days, you know, to take it to the bank and drop it in one of those drop shops. Right, right, right. And 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 he was walking, and all of a sudden he felt like he was being watched. He felt like he was like a little danger, and he stopped, and he closed his eyes, and he felt he felt he felt he felt into being safe, and he remembered Joe Goldsmith was praying for him, and then he the feeling went away, and then he ended up making the drop. And then he came to find out that uh, sometime later, a guy came up to him and said, you know, I followed you one night and I was going to rob you. And right when I was about to rob you, I saw that all these people were standing around you protecting you. And I wow. left. But there was nobody standing around him. But the person saw these people standing around him. He saw the angels around him. <laughs> and, and, he, and he left, you know. So when you said that, you know, uh, angels are around, you know, this particular would-be robber actually saw uh -huh. uh, these protecting angels around this person but thought they were, you know, corporal people standing uh -huh. around. But that is, that is true. You know, you build up a wall, you, you attract attack. Absolutely. So you're, you're basically speaking about consciousness. Yes. All, yes, all the things that you're weaving into your stories, happy money, true mm -hmm. wealth, Mm -hmm. You're actually getting people to expand their awareness, expand their container. Okay, what would you say before we go, and if you have any closing comments after that, to somebody who doesn't have anything? I mean, they're poor. It's mm -hmm. like they mm -hmm. may not even have a job right now. They're struggling to find a job, mm -hmm. you know, or to have some kind of income. How would you break these teachings down for somebody who's starting at zero or one? Mm -hmm. I think there is something that you can do for other people. You could be cleaning out. You can be just uh, giving massage. You can just listen to people. There is something you can do to help people. Mm -hmm. If you can help somebody in some ways, they will just offer you a sofa. They will offer you food. They will offer you a job eventually. So come up with something that whatever you can do, do it. And then uh, that will lead into an opportunity. And sometimes it, it could be the lowest paying job, but it's okay. You start from low and then uh, do more of what you can give. Do whatever you can, you know, clean or just support, uh, help uh, people move stuff. Whatever you, do, you can do from the scratch. Mm -hmm. And then find whatever you're good at. And then just keep on, shift, keep shifting your job to uh, more more you. And then uh, the more close closer to... Uh, wherever you're supposed to be, you get paid more. So mm -hmm. just find out your own reserved seat. You know, uh -huh. it, might take a, it might take a couple of years, but just find your seat where you're supposed to sit. That's your special seat. And then when once you get there, you know, everybody will appreciate you and respect you. And then it might take some time, but, you know, just make up your mind. I'll be there no matter what. People will support you. I think this world is so kind. If you just uh, trust it, uh, the help will help um, will show up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying, find some way to be useful. Yes. Yeah. So even if you don't have anything, ask how can I be useful today? Yes. How can yeah. I help? How can I help? And then the, the 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 universe will find a way for you to be useful. So you'll be you'll be giving energy. Mm -hmm. And then since we live in a return to cinder universe, that energy that you're putting out will come back in, in, in different ways, serendipity, coincidences, 
things of that particular nature, opportunities will open up. But you you have to get your mind on the side of how can I be useful rather than be just bemoaning your fate. Is that that's what that's what I'm hearing you say? Yes, I in fact from uh, age nineteen to twenty many years ago, I was in North America. I I spent one year depending on people's generosity and kindness. Mm -hmm. I didn't pay any money, but I traveled around from Boston to Florida, mm -hmm. uh, depending uh, uh, staying in a total stranger's house. Mm -hmm. And then they let me stay one night, two nights, maybe sometimes a month. And I was on uh, dependent on their generosity. And then I made a um, I made it back to Japan after one year. Mm -hmm. It was a great lesson to be total surrender. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you surrender, support will come. Yeah, you're surrendering to the abundance of the universe. Yeah, so I, I forever appreciate American people for being so generous. I so respect American people for being open and kind and generous to just give hands to people who are in need. There are many great uh, kind people in America so especially if you're in the States, just ask for help. You know, we're not good at asking for help. But once you do, you'll be amazed how many hands will just come to um, come to you and support. Yeah, I was looking at a report that when certain so-called disasters happen around the world, mm -hmm. before the governments even get involved, the American people already start donating to particular organizations to assist other people to uh, to safety, food, medical assistance, and things of that particular nature. And they seem to outgive governments many times, just the people themselves. Yes, and yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Ken, it's been great talking to you. Do you have any uh, last comments? Anything that we you want to cover? I know your, your, your the last your book is True Wealth. Uh-huh. And um, that's the one that's circulating now. I know that you have other books as well. Anything else you want to leave us with? And also, how can people be in touch with you? You said you have a podcast. Yes. How can people get in touch with you via your website, right. podcast, or whatever? Yeah. So not much happening in, in English yet. So mm -hmm. you can find all you can find all the information at kenhonda.com, K E N H O H O N D uh, uh, as a car, mm -hmm. kenhonda.com. And what I want to say is I so appreciate you, Michael, and all the uh, people in Agape International. I've seen so many uh, volunteers smiling, and they're generally nice people. So whoever watching this, and if you haven't been to uh, Agape's events, definitely you should. So that's the last thing I want to say. You know, <laughs> I really fell in love with the, uh, you, you and uh, your organization. And whenever I have a chance, I love to visit again. And they are so nice uh, and also very transformational experiences. So anybody who haven't been there, please go there. Thank you so very much. I appreciate that. I appreciate you coming. And for those of you, he, he, said, he said many of this is not in Japanese, but his books are in English. Happy Money is in English. Yeah. Right. True Wealth is in yes. English. Yes. And there it is yeah. right there, True Wealth. So they're in English, so you can get both of those books or either one of them. The True Wealth is a novel that carries all of the salient teachings in it, and Happy Money is a straight English teaching about what defines mo happy money, what defines unhappy money, and how you can participate more in having happy money. So Thank that, you. And also, lastly, I want to appreciate you for giving this endorsement to my book. It says, you know, Michael Beckworth here. So Absolutely. It was my, my pleasure. That. Yeah. I hope Thank it helps. <laughs> yes, yes, it does. And thank you for inviting me to your show. And uh, I'm sending all my blessings from the other side of the planet and sending you lots of happy money energy to you. I accept. I send, <laughs> I send it to you as well. Thank you. And we will talk soon. Have a beautiful day, Ken. Thank you. And uh, next time I see you, it might be in Japan unless we see each other earlier. Right, right. Okay, so see you very soon. Peace and blessings to you. Thank you, everyone. Dynamic blessings to you, and this is the portion of Take Back Your Mind, where we do just that. We go into a few moments of meditation and pull our attention away from the world of effects and circumstances, conditions, people, places, things, and the appearances, so that we can 
come to a deeper sense of contemplation of our own life that's independent of time and space, make new choices with a new sense of greater identity, and then watch that new identity become our law, and the outpicturing of that become a greater experience for our living. This is what meditation does. So in this moment, you know, we've had an opportunity to, to be with Brother Ken Honda. And one of the things that he was sharing with us was the elimination of this scarcity mindset to come into a field of abundance. When we talk about abundance, we're not talking about gross materialism. He said there were invisible features of abundance and wealth, love, kindness, compassion, generosity, creativity. These are all a part of the vibrational frequency of wealth and abundance as well that leads to circulation and that leads to the coin of the realm, leads to possibilities, it leads to potential, leads to opportunities showing up in our life. We actually can manifest more good in our life. So let us turn within in this moment. Close your outer eye. Receive a nice inhalation. Release. And begin to contemplate a moment where you actually felt in your life that you had more than enough. You were living in a state of prosperity, a state of abundance, affluence, opulence, that all of your needs were met. It doesn't matter what your chronological age was at the time. It could have been when you were five years young, or 10, or 13, or 25. But just come into a moment where you're striking the mystic chord of memory around the feeling tone of abundance of all needs met. Place your attention there. And we're going to meditate on this feeling tone of all needs met. You have extracted your attention from conditions and circumstances. And you're beginning this moment with the feeling that all of your needs are met. The feeling of living in abundance. Now take a pure inhalation. Sustain it at the apex. Take a little bit more air in, sustain it right there. Abundance, all needs met, feeling tone being amplified. Release with the sound of ah, ah. Now all I want you to do is pay attention to the feeling tone of abundance, harmonizing prosperity, and the tonal quality of all needs met. If the mind tries to take over and paint pictures of worst case scenarios or reminding you you don't have enough in the visible world, bring, take your mind back, take your attention back and come right now to the feeling that all of your needs are met. The feeling will provide the revealing. Feeling will provide the healing and then the revealing of that sacred truth.
you have dominion over your attention and you're being attentive to the feeling that all of your needs are met that you are living in abundance this is your heart set and your mind set allow yourself to feel a deep sense of gratitude that all of your needs are met so this becomes your new law your new law of life my needs are met all the time I'm so grateful that I'm in alignment with the timeline of my life where I'm deeply fulfilled all of my needs are met I live in abundance and harmonizing prosperity it's happening now feel into that and let it be as you open your eyes put a smile on your face be extremely grateful that you have set something new in your life and so it is have a beautiful day it's your choice I appreciate your letters and emails that you've been sending in, but also the notes you're sending on the Instagram and on the website thanking me for Take Back Your Mind. And I thank you for your support. As I've said before, if you want to support Take Back Your Mind, support the sponsors. The main sponsor is the Agape International Spiritual Center, agapelive.com. We have a Facebook presentation, an Instagram presentation, a YouTube presentation, and a website presentation. You can donate to the sponsor at agapelive.com. It's one way that you can donate. It supports the podcast. Second sponsor is Nutrarise.com. You go to Nutrarise.com, those three lines up at the top, you touch that line, and you'll get Adapt Zen. Adapt Zen are my products the super green, superfood greens, and the vitamin D3, K2. Both extremely good for your health, your nutrition. You support the sponsors, you're supporting the podcast. Have a beautiful, and as I like to say, a bright day, luminous day, because you are a luminous being. Peace and blessings. Your time is very valuable, so I want to thank you for lending us your ear and participating in taking back your mind. If you want to submit a question for the question of the week, please submit it to podcast at michaelbeckwith.com. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please submit a review and let us know your thoughts. Stay on top of current episodes by subscribing to the podcast so that you'll receive alerts and not miss one single episode. And feel free to share this podcast with all of your friends and family. And until we meet again, take back your mind and you will take back your life. Peace and blessings.